Good evening, boa noite. Thank you for joining us today in this conversation sponsored by Kitchell with photographer Mona Kuhn. It is a pleasure to welcome you all. My name is Sylvia Perea. I am the curator of the architecture and design collection at the Art, Design and Architecture Museum of the University of Santa Barbara, of California in Santa Barbara. Before we start, I wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land upon which our university is located and pay my respects to the Chumash elders, past, present, and future generations, for they hold the memories, the traditions, and the culture of this area, which has become a place of learning for people from all over the world. Today, we are going to talk about the exhibition 835 Kings Road, which presents for the first time the series of photographs that Munakum House in West Hollywood. This exhibition is currently on view at the ad &E Museum. If you have not had a chance of coming by, please do so before May 1st, when the exhibition is scheduled to close. Now, it is my honor to introduce you to Mona Kuhn. She is a leading artist in the world of figurative photography, who has developed a unique visual language through an acute and poetic understanding of human existence and fate. Underlying her work is the reflection on the human being longing for a solidarity and for connecting with others in a deep level. In this regard, Kuhn highlights the nude figure deprived of any signs of social, cultural, or economic status as the symbol that unites us all. Kuhn's photographs themselves stem from the relationship that she establishes with her sitters. Imbued with atmospheric warmth, they evoke a sense of comfort between the human figure and its environment. Her distinct approach to photography adds a unique contribution to the figurative canon in contemporary art. Not surprisingly, her photographs are included in renowned private and public collections, and her work is exhibited globally. Over the past two years, I've had the tremendous honor of collaborating with Mona Kuhn in the development of 835 Kings Road, alongside a wonderful team, which is very multidisciplinary, and that includes, among others, the composer, Boris Salto, the professor of theater design at UCSB, Greg Mitchell, and the visual artist, Wong Ho Lee. And as I said, as among many other selfless contributors to whom I am forever grateful. The event today will be in two parts. First, Kuhn and I are going to do a quick presentation of Rudolf Schindler and the Schindler House that she has used for her series, as well as the exhibition that has come out, out, of, of, out of her work at the house. And um, this is meant for especially those of you who have not seen the exhibition yet and that are not yet um, familiar with the house and the architect. And then during the second part, um, I'm going to have a conversation with the artist and I invite you all to um, write your questions in the Q&A so that I can address them with her. Thank you very much. So now, if you allow me, I'm going to share my presentation. So as I was saying, I'm going to introduce very generally both the architect and the house that are part of Kuhn's series, um, this, this series, Kings Road. 835 Kings Road is the address of the iconic proto-modernist Schindler House built 100 years ago by the Austrian emigre architect Rudolf Schindler in what would later become West Hollywood. Born and raised in Vienna at the turn of the 20th century, when the city emerged as an avant-garde cultural and artistic epicenter, Rudolf Schindler studied architecture under some of the most forward-thinking Viennese architects of the time, Otto Wagner and Adolf Loss, most notably. Sharing Loss' enthusiasm with the mighty industrial architecture that was being built in the US at the time, and also fascinated by the organic architecture of Frank Lloyd Wright, Schindler moved to the US in 1914 in hopes of working for the master from Wisconsin, a dream that he fulfilled in 1917. 
Three years later, Wright sent Schindler to Los Angeles. And at the end of 1921, Schindler, with the help of his wife, Pauline, designed his famous house, where Monacoon, nearly 100 years later, developed her King's Road project. As Schindler acknowledged, the architecture of the house combined the metaphors of a cave and a tent. Thus, it presented solid, slanted concrete walls, separated three inches to let sunlight come in, as you see here in these very narrow windows, about which we will talk later, all facing light movable panels that opened the house completely to the outdoors, a feature that would characterize the development of modern architecture in Southern California from the 1920s on. The house was innovative in some other additional ways. It was designed as a cooperative dwelling for Schindler and his wife, another couple, and a tenant, a concept atypical at the time for a single family house. The floor plan was such that enabled each person to have its own studio, where no functions were predetermined by neither the space nor the furniture. The scheme, as you can see here, was very anti-hierarchical. This was uh, Rudolf Schindler's studio, Pauline's, his wife, and the other couple's studio, plus the tenant who would live here. There were some sleeping baskets uh, or sleeping quarters planned on the rooftop, according to the epoch's beliefs in that uh, sun exposure, exercise, and outdoor living had wonderful and great benefits for the health. There was only one kitchen, here you see it in the core of the scheme, that was supposed uh, to serve the needs of the families and the dwellers and where uh, women were supposed to take turns for cooking, thus alleviating a little bit the workload of their daily duties at the house. Also influenced by the progressive social ideals of Pauline Schindler, these unusual features foster a communal and flexible lifestyle that suited the liberal spirit of the group of artists and intellectuals who gather at the house regularly. And some of these materials that you are seeing now are part of the architecture and design collection here at the museum. Um, some of which have provided Mona with the base for developing her series. So I'm going to invite her to take on the lead and talk us a little bit about her experience at the archives. Hello, everyone. I wanted to thank you, Sylvia, for inviting me to this conversation and this wonderful opportunity to share with everyone here today um, a little bit of the behind the scenes and the thinking and the creative process of this work. Um, I moved to Los Angeles in 2005 and I moved to the West Hollywood area and right away um, a few friends said, have you been to the Schindler House, which is on Sweetser and King's Road. And I think it was already on my first or second year here that I was introduced to the house and I really felt in love the moment that I walked into the house. I didn't know for sure why I felt in love. It was a very intuitive um, uh, first introduction. And then uh, eventually I got curious and wanted to uh, um, started having a wish of creating a body of work somehow incorporating the house, incorporating some of the emotions that I felt as I entered the house and to do so, I, like with any of my works, I also wanted to learn more about the architect and learn more about um, the thinking and the concepts behind. And I found out that at the university, uh, university in Santa Barbara, that, uh, that they had the, one of the largest archives for architects in the nation. So I felt very lucky that I'm just one, one and a half hour away from it and that I could start visiting or contacting and, and stopping by and taking a look at the archives. And of course, I was first very um, enamored with all of the straightforward blueprints and all of the very rich material uh, Schindler lived has a lot of letters with Frank Lloyd Wright that are very interesting and Neutra and Adolf Loos, an architect back in Vienna. But I continued digging, digging, digging and something in me uh, 
felt that it needed to be deeper. I wanted to know the man behind the architect. And I wanted to get into material that maybe wasn't published in the past until the day that I found a box with a few folders inside that had the word unpublished marked on it. And I got very excited about it. And I opened one of those folders and I found among many things, this, this letter. And this letter just pierced, literally pierced into my heart um, because to me, it seemed to be a letter of an unfulfilled love or a letter between two people that maybe were not, uh, did not have a chance of being together for various reasons, but something strong in them uh, wanted to be there. So they, it, it's a love story that maybe was desynchronized. Um, there was the first paragraph that draw my attention called your dreams will never like so many meet reality. Um, and then as you move forward, it is a mistake to place one's whole world onto uh, one point or person. The world is endlessly big and life rich without bottom. You will find your way, you will find your treasures without me. Um, it's a letter that is signed by Rudolf. Uh, it's a letter that does not have the name of the person who he wanted to send it to. So in a way, this letter allowed me to create uh, my own story, my own artistic interpretation. At that point, when I found this letter, I was already very familiar with him as an architect and the architectural concepts. But I, it was very important for me to considering my background to also bring a living layer to this story. Uh, let's go to the next one. So I, cre I started uh, thinking about who this person could have been. Um, and I reached out to a friend of mine that I had worked in the past uh, and felt very comfortable with me. We had already a trusting relationship established and I asked her, uh, I told her about the story. I told her about uh, this, my wish of bringing these two people back together. And she was just finishing her studies in psychology. She just finished her PhD in psychology. And we were talking about this idea of crossing the elements of time or finding each other through space and time. And she really got into the, 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 the story behind that I wanted to create the visual poetry. And she came over to Los Angeles, stayed with me, and we had the permission uh, from the Max Center and the friends of the Schindler House to start photographing a, a person inside the house. The house had been photographed um, before. It has been included in operas and in various artists have been um, inspired by the house but more but but we haven't really seen a presence of a of a person or a being and to me that is so important uh, from the basic point of view of we are in a way rectangles and the house was the doors exist in our own format of our bodies so to me architecture and the living person uh, and the human presence it goes hand in hand and that's how I started photographing uh, the house. Uh, let me see the next slide. And uh, what I also found in the house was elements of Schindler himself, as if he was there. For example, this chair uh, was designed, uh, Schindler was an architect, but he also designed furniture. And I couldn't help myself to think that that is the chair that he would be sitting on if he was there. So to me, this whole visual poetry started expanding and started having a life of his own. And the house and the letter and his handwriting became what is left of him. Uh, what are his remains? And then the person, I wanted to really bring the person to enter this house and find him in it. Uh, let's see the next one. Now, this house has a couple of things that also inspired me right away. The idea of bringing together this harmony 
between the living elements and nature, uh, something that I had explored in the past in my works, but also was very important for me to have this idea of a, in, photographically speaking, from an optical point of view, uh, to photograph the house, not necessarily as a uh, architectural photographer, but to really explore the peripheral vision. So what is happening as we are walking through this house or as these two people are walking through the house or the audience or, um, or anyone really, what is most of the people will have in the forefront of their vision, everything very much sharp. But what happens on the periphery of your vision? What happens on the sides and how do you perceive? Why is it that at times we feel so comfortable in a place uh, and, and, and what are the connections that are happening on the side of our intellect? So that is a couple of things, a couple, that is a, a certain visual technique that I have used in my works before that I brought into the architectural uh, images of the house itself. Um, and in thinking of the, the concepts of time, uh, having in mind that this house was built a hundred years ago, um, having in mind that I wanted to really push that idea of crossing the elements of time and space. Um, space being related to the architect uh, concept of space architecture, uh, and then time uh, because of bringing those two together. I started, I started uh, looking at elements of the house that were maybe a little bit more spiritual, maybe a little bit more uh, towards metaphysical. And I started engaging with some of the images that had to do with just light, just a spirit entering the house and evoking and, and waking up other spirits of the house. Um, now, this is one of the images uh, that I took, which in a, in a, hold on, Sylvia, if we can still look at the one before. This is an image that I took first, taking into consideration the light and, and what enters through the crevices of this house. Um, but in conversations with Sylvia, and then later on also in conversations with the composer, Boris Alcho, uh, it turned out that we started looking at images like that in a more musical way, uh, as if it could be um, you know, a, a music score. And I think that a lot of this project really started evolving, not just through my photography, but also through the many conversations um, as, as I started sharing some of the work. And Sylvia has been at the studio in Los Angeles and has seen uh, me putting all those images together. Um, let's look at the next one. So one of the big uh, challenges for me was how do I bring someone into this house and not look um, a little too simplistic? So one of the ways that I studied, studied and found a solution for my own photographic means was to go back in time and realize that the house was built in between 1920 and 1922. And in the history of photography, that was the time where we had the photo surrealists like Irving Blumenfeld and uh, Man Ray, among others. And at that time in Paris or in New York, they were playing and pushing certain elements of photography, which was considered at that time to be very much about a record keeping. Uh, once they started playing with uh, the solarization process, which is a very experimental darkroom technique, once they started playing it with it, some accidents would happen. Uh, Lee Miller was also part of, of some of that experimentation. And parts of the image or the presence of the person would be there in the flash while other elements of the image and of the oxidized silver would then dematerialize in ways where this person, it's questionable if the record is accurate, if this person was there or not. So that allowed me the that allowed me some freedom to create images of the person in a way that she crosses the realm of time. Um, and I was able to work uh, with her and in 
incorporate, let's see the, maybe the next image, incorporate elements of the house uh, to learn about the, sh the architectural structures and the shadows and the time of the day. Uh, I photographed in the house uh, during different seasons uh, while the sun was moving and, and hitting different areas of this house. And we were able to predict a little bit uh, what would be the best room to photograph in the morning or in the afternoon or what would be the, a more favorable season. And my friend and I then uh, played this role where she's present in, the in this house, but the structure of the house is also in a way touching her or becoming her. Um, to me, in a more visually poetic way, it was a way of bringing them together, those two elements of her and him as an architect. And this is wonderful, Mona. Thank you for, for digging a little bit into the behind the scenes. Um, of course, as you mentioned, this, this project is being uh, the fruit of a ongoing uh, conversation that gets to today. And when I approached your photos for the first time, I, uh, I approached them with the eyes of an architect. And, and so space was very present in, in my mind. And when I looked at your photos, I, I was completely absorbed by the spaciousness that they reflected. And what I mean by that is that there is more space around you uh, than just the, the space that is in front of the camera in that you are capturing through the reflections, you're capturing the space that is behind you. So that was very magical to see how different layers of space became compressed in these, um, in these uh, photos. So in here, for example, you're seeing how the outdoors, the garden of the house enters or seemingly enters the interior of the house. And this was actually a, a symbol of what Rudolf Schindler was um, aiming to do by having a very light and movable partitions that open the house completely to the outdoors. And, and that became kind of a, a seminal um, contribution to modern architecture in Southern California, as you, as you know well, the integration between the indoors and the outdoors. But also there are um, in your series, there are photos such as this one that seem to atomize the space, seem to spray it or kind of diffuse it. And that is also very interesting from the architectural point of view because it seems like um, in a way space is evaporating. And this is a very interesting uh, photo as well because Mona is not inside the house. She's photographing this partition and curtain from the outside, looking through one of these very narrow um, glass uh, windows that we were referring to previously. And this is a third example of how um, Mona's, uh, the treatment of the space in Mona's photos is done in a very artistic way. In her solarized photos, there are parts of them that are burned, that disappear or seem to evaporate, as I was saying. And there are other parts, like you see here, this contour, that are crayoned or um, in a way, um, you know, underlined. And so it's this idea of considering space as an artistic matter that really connects Mona's work with the work of Schindler, because Schindler was known for introducing the concept of space architecture, which consisted on considering space as an artistic matter, as something that could be malleable and that could be shaped and molded, rather than thinking that architecture was the, an operation to, to define a program uh, with walls. He was more interested and understanding space as a compositional matter. And that is really what connects both things together. And what, um, when I saw the photos, I, I, I saw a project, an exhibition project in front of us very clearly. Now, how to translate this into the exhibition space was um, another um, perhaps point of reflection between Mona and I, we found that there was a story 
there was the lady coming back, um, metaphorically looking for Schindler, um, hovering through the house, finding the house empty, and um, sitting down, reflecting, undressing, and at the end, laying down, infusing with the architecture. And so there is this sequence of events in the story that we didn't want to lose in a way with the installation. Um, and we thought that by framing the photos and by displaying them on the wall as traditionally, you know, an exhibition of uh, photography has, has been made, we thought that the story would be broken. And also this idea of the connection between the concept of space architecture and the visual poetics of Mona's uh, photographs would be lost. So we ended up thinking that the best way to convey uh, the depth and the gravitas of Mona's photos was with projections. And I don't like to use the word projections because one thinks, may think of, of you know, projections in a, in a movie theater. This is a little bit more complex than that. What we wanted to achieve was this sense of depth of the photos. And so we used a very light screens that are made with a theatrical screen that are able to filter the images and let the image go through and invade the surrounding space. So the exhibition is in two parts. This is the camera obscura where all of that is going on. And then we have a camera lucida where we have the archive materials that Mona has used as an inspiration and also those materials that explain the concept of um, space architecture as um, proposed by Schindler and also applied to the design of his own house. So in between both cameras, there are three very sturdy walls that relate to the walls of the house. They are separated the same distance as in the, in the house, as well as a very light structure that reminds a little bit of these Japanese looking screens that he used to connect or separate the interior and the exterior. So there is, these are very subtle uh, references to the house. We didn't want to reproduce the house, but certainly bring some poetic notes into the installation that reminded um, the, the, the presence and the importance of the house. So this is a photo of the Camera Lucida where we have the archive materials. And as I said, in this part, we are exploring the sources from which Schindler draw inspiration for coming up with this um, concept of space architecture. And in the other part, we have a, you know, the application of that concept into the design of his own house. And these are the three sturdy walls and the, um, the small windows, so to speak abstracted or represented in a very abstract way. Now, I want to invite Mona to uh, talk a little bit about the Camera Obscura. Right, so <clears throat> here is, you, you entered the, the area that Silvia called the Camera Lucida with the archive materials and you saw on the sides, the uh, blackout curtains. And once you enter, you have a quite large room with three standing screens. And in those screens, um, the one thing that we didn't, it's hard to describe exactly, but the one thing that we did not want to do was a slideshow. So what we did instead was um, a certain symphony of images in concert with also surround sound um, and worked with a composer to create a 15 minute, this piece is a 15 minute, 15 minutes long, and to create an original score that goes with it. The images move in and out into uh, this symphony of projections. They also move up and down. And at times you have all of the screens showing there are, there are four projectors here. Uh, one for each lateral screen and two projectors for the central uh, center screen. Now, it's really important to understand that the screen are, are 12 foot uh, tall, so almost like twice my height. And uh, it is, in a way, very referential to creating a certain space. But she also has this osmosis with the larger space of the room 
itself. Um, as you step in there, one of the ideas of bringing those images together in different uh, compositions of, of tr or trilogies, so to speak, was to have this feeling that you yourself, you're entering the house or you're entering their thoughts or you're, you yourself, the, the viewer is actually wandering around. Um, let's see the next one. Um, there is a moment there too where this is now behind the screen. There is a gap between that U-shape main center screams uh, and then a gap between the where the screens are located versus the, the actual wall on the left side, you actually have the gallery wall. And we wanted to explore the duality. There were a couple of things happening here. One, we wanted that idea that the image itself crossed a certain realm, that it doesn't stay fixed into one solid screen but that it has a double or what sometimes we say in printmaking that it has a ghost image. Um, so we, in that sense, we were able to explore the space in not just a 3D, but sometimes people that have come and seen the exhibi exhibition when it opened mentioned, wow, here I get to see Schindler's blueprint of this house in a almost 60, 6D, level where you have the three screens in the in of the of the installation itself plus the three walls and all the space in between so that was exciting for us to create uh, an experience where people can almost walk into it right right now you see an image that is a still so it is not moving but the piece itself in the installation itself this <clears throat> a blueprint is coming up and it's moving and there is also four different loudspeakers in different areas uh, in the extreme opposites of the room, creating a whole uh, dramatization of uh, the blueprint. Um, I really like this image and this moment because it's also not a moment that you are static looking at it. You yourself as a viewer, you will move slightly to the right and slightly to the left. And in doing so, um, you find your own angles into the blueprint or the presentation of the house or the relationship with the living layer. So you, in a way, the viewer constantly is moving around and finding your own angles as a photographer or your own angles as an architect. And to me, that was the very interesting part of, of this exhibition and for me to, and a learning experience for me as well. Uh, let's go to the next one. Ah, so what I wanted to say, we have, um, we put here together, uh, I'm aware that uh, some people have not yet had the chance to come see the exhibition. So we put, we made a little video and uh, to share with you in a more moving uh, a way, which is closer to what the experience is. I would like to take a moment for you guys to uh, turn on the volume so you can hear the, the score. And also to warn you that this motion right now, we, as if you, as if I, as if you are entering with me and with Sylvia, we're using the uh, the curtains on the right side, and we're turning immediately left to enter the center space of this installation. Uh, all right, let's go for it. to live and work in California. I camped under the open sky, in the redwoods, on the beach, the foothills, and the desert. I tested its adobe, its granite, 
and its sky. And out of a carefully built up conception of how the human being could grow roots in the soil, unique and delightful, I built my house. So I think that gives you uh, uh, an idea of how it's all in motion as you enter. And hopefully everyone will have a chance to come over. Um, this image, we included this, uh, what you saw happening that in, in, in that uh, microsecond is you saw a hand, first of all, you saw some of my images of the house and the person, but also on the second half of it, you saw a eight by 10 uh, sketch, hand sketch that Rudolf Schindler did of a house, a very, uh, not a sketch that you would do to present to a large, large audience, but a bit more of an intimate, a little bit more loose, uh, something that maybe he wasn't thinking that he was gonna share. Um, and that is the kind of material in the archive that I was interested in. Um, and then together with the help of one hole, I was able to then transfer that eight by 10 sketch into this very large scale. And to me it was also interesting to play with scale. And here you can see this, the, this visitor coming into the installation and you see the difference between his height and the, and the screens and how um, I have watched this now a couple of times from the center of it, and I have enjoyed, but I have spent more time behind it, walking around and finding uh, my own angles. Um, let's see the next one. So this, we included this image here to show a couple of things here. One, to show how the main the, these theatrical screams um, were a certain material that allowed the, fir the first projection to be very loyal to the image itself. But it also gave us this wonderful um, characteristic of allowing the image to cross the realm of the first scream and have a second very well-defined image on the walls as well. So. This is just to show that part, but also to show that I we are looking at this image on the second half of it to the right side. You, we are behind one of those lateral uh, screens, meaning at meaning you don't even see the screen there. So at times we composed these uh, projections in a way that it will occupy the entire space and you really feel that you're inside the house. And sometimes the lateral screams would be, would not have any projection and you will feel the emptiness of the space in front of us. So it was really a composition of not just images but a composition of playing with scale and space itself. Uh, let's see the next one. And I also wanted to, this, this image was taken at the, at the installation week uh, earlier this year, and I really like it because it gives a more technical understanding of uh, how it all came together, and it also gives a chance to highlight from the left to the right, um, Greg Mitchell, who is a professor of theater and design, uh, Silvia Perea, the curator of architecture design collection at ADNA Museum. Uh, I'm lucky to be at the center as the artist. Uh, then there is Boris on the right side of me. He's a composer that made this original score. I consider myself very lucky to be able to collaborate with a composer and go over all of the enuendos of making music. It was an incredible experience for me. And on the right side, Wonho, who is a wonderful media artist and designer and helped me bring what I am known for, which is the still images into the moving images. This was great. Thank you so much.
much, Mona. And um, I, I'd like to invite everybody to um, add your questions in the Q&A in the box down there. You can enter your questions. I'm going to uh, go ahead and jump into the first question that I have for you. Um, I, I'd like to bring this, this quote from Schindler, which I find very um, beautiful, but also connected to your work. He said, the sense of, for the perception of architecture is not the eyes, but living. Our life, it's, it's image. Or in other words, experience defines architecture, which is to say that the architect's role is to define the lifestyle. And I'm very interested to start with, you know, a preliminary question about your experience in the house as you enter the house and how it shaped the, the series that you've made. Because you had a very particular experience there. Yes, well, for me, it was in a way that experience of being had a, had really a soul connection to the place and not necessarily understanding how um, I felt that I um, I felt that my body entered the house. Uh, so as an artist, as a figurative artist, I am uh, I, I understand that I cannot es escape my own body. So that is how I see the world, and that is how I have. Um, work with the figure as a platform for emotions and for desires and fears and everything that makes our life so rich. Mm -hmm. um, so I, when I entered the house, I felt like I was entering his body or his remains. Um, the house has um, uh, uh, half of the house, the outer shell, so to speak, uh, has those elements of the uh, concrete. Uh, but it's poured concrete. So I started finding some areas of the concrete that melted together that to me looked like wrinkles, like the skin. Um, I also saw uh, the houses then uh, made with redwood beams and it's exposed, it's not painted, it's not polished. Um, and to me, the redwood um, lines of the, the 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 wood itself looked like veins um so and, and the fragility of the inner the courtyards where instead of putting very firm walls so the outer walls were mostly concrete and then the in and then the inside of this uh, uh space that he created all of the intimate walls so to speak were very fragile uh it's either glass or the Japanese uh, sliding doors with canvas. Uh, it was very vulnerable. Uh, and those, to me, were all of those elements that have always made me very curious and also made me very comfortable. Those are my elements that, mm -hmm. uh, in, 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 if, if you look at all the work that I have done over a long period of time, you find the same elements. And now suddenly I am here in a house of an architect that has uh, the same elements in his own work and it's a completely new thing for me. So I really felt uh, in love intuitively right away. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, sometimes the intuition needs to learn and take some time to, to, to follow with the intellect. So the intellect part for me was the part that I had this wonderful chance to go to the archives to have access to it and really learn what is it that the intuition was telling me that I was trying to catch up to it. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, so I think that's, I, I hope I answer your question. Yeah, I know, absolutely. And, and you bring about a beautiful point too, which is this duality or parallelism that exists between the house as a house that was not meant to um, show um, any appearance or, or to, to identify any social status. Um, Schindler was very clear in, in that he wanted the house to be lived and that it was inspired by a, a certain um, you know, lifestyle values. Um, and therefore he conceived a house that is not finished where the materials are um, presented as they are. They are not painted, they are not burnished, um, they are raw. And that exposure 
uh, relates to the exposure of the body, as you were saying, uh, you know, the, the idea of the skin and the um, resonance with, with the wrinkles of the concrete. But, you know, we could almost say that um, we could understand the house as a body, um, you know, as a nude body. And the nude body that you introduce with the woman and with her womb in her interior space, there, there's some, some architecture there as well. So um, that, that's the parallelism that is it's perhaps evident, but I, I find it very poetic and very um, inspiring in, in, in this particular series, that correspondence. Yeah. Well, another thing that to me was also very curious is that we need to transport ourselves to the 1920s. Um, just the fact that uh, Schindler came from Austria, he was an immigrant. Um, if we think about what was going on at, at the moment in time, uh, we have the Spanish flu, for example. Uh, now we are a lot more aware of it, um, 1918. Um, so the, the fact that Schindler decided to have this two, this two, the, the bedrooms above the ceiling of the house exposed to, to uh, the uh, to the sun or exposed to the wind, uh, open to the sky. It was still considered to be a nest, but mm -hmm. it was very much about being in the fresh air, uh, and the fresh air and the body and the nude in 1920s was very much considered signs of freedom and signs of health. Mm -hmm. So uh, to to get your vitamin D and and and, and was you know eventually on. Uh, towards the end of Spanish flu, that's what they were doing with the patients. So I think that all of that coming together uh, really transported me into that, that moment, into the, uh, in a way, also the lifestyle that they had in the house. Mm -hmm. um, and it really flourished. Uh, mm -hmm the my 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 visual narrative mm -hmm. uh, it really added a lot of elements uh to me that were very inspiring that stayed with me where i would go back over and over uh to the house to uh find those spirits so to speak uh to really try to tap into uh the bohemia of the moment H how could it how did someone feel as they entered this place and they were being welcomed and the friends were all around and nowadays maybe here in California we are used to having the sliding doors uh, but that was the first house as far as I understand that had it at the time so that was very innovative also having a um, having that idea of a, 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 um, a fireplace not just inside of the house but in the outside of the house. So you hang out in the garden and you have the flat fireplace. So all of those elements uh, to me, me were very much about a sense of uh, letting go of barriers, letting go of hard walls the, that, define, that overly define uh, where one's, one needs to be and give a lot more freedom for people to explore and to be uh, more free and to wander really mm -hmm. to be themselves mm -hmm. certainly your series um distance distances itself from the photography of architecture in that photography of architecture is much more straightforward normally if it includes if human figure is to give the scale rather than to develop a visual fiction as you've done uh, it's normally normally more objective less less subjective or poetic as you've done. And it normally also adds more definition to what the architect has envisioned. It's about enhancing those aspects that make the house particularly attractive and, and sellable and um, you know interesting and appealing to the, the eye. And but your series is much more subjective. There is the story, there is this fiction. It, it opens the door to actually imagine a new way of telling architecture, which is from the experience, from the, um, from the point of view of the person who inhabits and who uses the space. 
And I find that particularly interesting for not only architects, but also students of architecture in this very moment where um, the definition of architecture is still, you know, evolving. Um, I think that it, it, it is a, um, a wonderful way of um, approaching architecture in a different way, um, you know, inspiring for sure. Yeah. Well, when we started the conversation, it was a little before the pandemic, it was almost two years ago. Um, I, I, I always like to remember the moment where we were walking into this uh, big space into the, you know, one of the main galleries in the museum. And you were showing me the space and I was uh, a little overwhelmed because it was a very prominent kind of space. And uh, we had that moment, well, where both of us kind of looked at each other and said, well, I mentioned I'm a little tired of showing the work framed as photography as I know how to do it and I have done it so for so many years and I remember the moment where there was a sigh and you're like well is is there another way of showing a blueprint coming mm -hmm. from the coming from the architectural point of view is there another way of showing um the the a living layer into the beautiful incredible masterpiece of an architect ar architectural masterpiece so mm -hmm. i think that's when we started this conversation um and for me it was also very exciting to be able to project these very fragile letters uh to project his handwriting to this really large scale where his intimate thoughts would just be so you know uh, uh, um, presented in, 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 in such a way, uh, I have always enjoyed that I have a little bit in me, I have this old kind of soul. Um, so I always enjoy the fact that in a way, I think that we uh, gave a jolt of life to the archive itself. Like how do you, how do you bring life and, and, and a, a dynamic force into, uh, into someone's, um, archive and conservation. Mm -hmm. um, I, I am, all of that being said, I'm also very grateful that the, the archive gave me the freedom, right? That, that there was, uh, my work was not intended to be a record of Schindler. Um, it was not intended to be documentary. It was intended to be lyrical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have a question from the audience uh, that I, I'd like to introduce with one of my questions. So Mark Harris, if you allow me, I'm going to fuse both of our questions together. Um, so, and in that regard, I'm going to quote Erwin Blumenfeld because he has a wonderful quote to introduce this question. He said that photography is immensely difficult because it's so easy to get a picture of sorts. One must work hard to smuggle anything into a photograph other than re record keeping. Uh, tell us a little bit about the experimental dimension of the series and how you have smuggled something completely new into these, these series. Well, it's always a problem, right? Because it is true, nowadays we all have iPhones and as a photographer, there's always uh, the fear of, um, in a way, the, the, the fear of losing because of technology advances and moving forward. And I think that photography is a modern medium. And in that sense, it is important for us to keep up with times and to keep up with uh, technology. So in the past, when I uh, understood that my main uh, passion in life is to photograph people, to photograph the new, to photograph the presence, I, of course, um, ran into this question, okay, so the nude has been photographed and painted and sculpted uh, uh, and throughout the times. Why should I do that again, right? So very at the very beginning of my creative journey, um, it was already something that I wanted to make that a very significant challenge. And I wanted to... Uh, see if I can carve a way around everything that has been done and try to bring some of my own um, visual vocabulary, watching very much 
what feels comfortable to me and what I don't want to be part of my visual vocabulary. So um, it's it's definitely a bit of a carving of of um, understanding the history, understanding the very long 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 language of nudes in art history throughout the times. Mm -hmm. And when I got uh, when I entered this house, I felt that oh I feel so great here. I must do something. I, I will pursue this just to find out that of course the house has been photographed by so many great uh, photographers of international level and have been the source of a lot of inspiration of uh, many books that have been done uh, not just architects but um, artists of all, all all walks of life and I think just like in the nudes that wasn't enough of a barrier for me so I my way of dealing with those things was to learn and, and get a, a more in-depth understanding of the space and the architect and the subject matter, so to speak, and then uh, relying on that depth of knowledge to then suddenly start giving me the answers. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, and I'm, I'm very interested in knowing a little bit about the, the process and the experimental process in the dark room developing um, you know, solarized images that you had used in previous series that, that have taken kind of a protagonist role here too. Tell us a little bit about you know, how did you decide to go back to the dark room and, and use solarization in, in this series? Right, so I had a, uh, I had a, series, uh, a series that just came a little bit before that I used solarization and I dabbled into it. Um, and I then realized that what I learned from that series, which was a little bit more of a photographic um, uh, gesture, so to speak, I, was, I realized that I didn't quite use to its full capacity. And when I started working uh, at the Schindler house, that's when I found the main space for this experimentation that what seemed to be a, a previous series where I applied solarization uh, seemed to be almost like the kindergarten that I needed to learn to bring to this project. Um, so solarization is a darkroom technique that you do from negatives. Uh, you usually have two, two or more enlargers. You have the standard uh, chemistry uh, with the trays, with the different chemistry. And you first make a very uh, straightforward uh, uh, projection of the light with the negative onto the paper, like a standard, uh, I don't know exactly how it's called, but a standard uh, 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 projection. And then what you do, you create, you, you, you create a, a standard exposure, sorry. Mm -hmm. And then what you do, you expose that paper to a flash of light that uh, at best you try to control so that is not too, too much of a variable. But in the flash of light, um, you create a certain tension with the materials in the paper, with the, with the silver, with the bromide, with the different kind of uh, uh, chemicals that then when you transfer into the developer, there is a break of the curve, like it stresses the material. And when it stresses the material, that's when you have the de dematerialization of some of the silver mm -hmm. oxidiz oxidizing. And also when you, you, when you start seeing that certain line, which they call the Maki line, mm -hmm. um, which in 1920s, that's when the main artist at the time started looking at photography for the very first time as an art form because they said, oh, it looks like an alchemist sketch. And it looks like the photographer cannot quite control it. Um, and it's undefined. You cannot, you cannot predetermine what the print is gonna look at the end of this process. Once you put the paper into the chemical, into the developer, um, within a few seconds, you can tell if it's, if it worked or if there is a potential or if it is a total flop. 
Now, I like to do this analogy that solarization is like doing a souffle uh, that you uh, like a chocolate souffle or so that you put it on the oven, everything is perfect. You follow the perfect uh, culinary recipe and it, it grows and it becomes beautiful and it's, and, and it's fantastic. And then when you, when you take it out exactly at the time that you're supposed to, the whole souffle collapses and it didn't work out. So the reason why the period of the 1920s, um, it, so, so I stopped by at the, at the Getty Research Institute as well. And I had a chance to talk to the curator, Vir Virginia Hackard, and she walked me through all of the materials of solarization at the time. And what she brought up in the conversation, which, which was so interesting to me was that many movements in photography, you have a large amount of samples that defined those movements in time. With solarization is a very skinny liver, sliver. And the reason why it's a very skinny sliver is because it's a process that most of the time times fails. So me going back into the dark room, uh, I no longer have a dark room here. So I had to rent a dark room. I work with someone uh, that owns a place uh, that was also very much interested in, in understanding solarization. And uh, it was, in a nutshell, it was a very humbling process because the chemicals of nowadays, of course, have changed. The papers have changed and everything uh, that we know how, you know, all the information that we had that, 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 that came through, through time uh, that we have in, in doing a darkroom solarization from the negative, all of that information was obsolete because all the materials are different. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was the first time that I go to the dark room for two, three, four days, 10, day, 10 hours each day, and I do not come out of it with anything great. Uh, so it's the kind of thing that it also, uh, you know, you have to have a little bit of a persistence there. And I think it was only on the fifth day that we got something that looked a little bit more hopeful and we started, you know, finding our, our path into it. Mm -hmm. So we are over the hour and uh, this is what happens with Mona. Conversations go on and on and on in the last years. Um, but I wanna pose a question from the audience, um, which is from Richard Cho, Cho and he says, amazing images and installation, congrats. What may be the most valuable experience you had or learned with this project? Um, so I would say uh, the teamwork I had, I had a chance with the museum being inside a university, we had a chance, we had so much more, so many more resources. For example, the pleasure of working with Greg Mitchell, who is a professional in the theater world. Um, you know, this interdisciplinary, the art history, the archive, the photography, the theater, um, multi multimedia. I think that that to me was the first time that I had such a uh, large um, uh, collaboration with, with multidisciplinary backgrounds. Um, and also for me, what was very, very uh, satisfactory is to see uh, the viewers coming in and uh, finding their angles or moving it in a way like I would like to I would like people not to take this exhibition as as it has to be but for them to challenge the exhibition a little bit and to try to uh, uh, if you were an architect how would you have built this house how, start making your own associations um, within that that environment uh, so that that I think all of that were big lessons and, and hopefully we can apply them forward. Um, a couple of years ago, when we started this conversation, Mona, you had a beautiful comment saying that you got inspiration when you went to museums and you, find, you know, found a, a, an artwork that spoke to you and you felt this kind of uplifting moment and that you pursued with your photography to um, to have those type of moments or to provide those type of moments to to others in a way you said um, you know I wish that my photography can you know a few generations ahead of us be uh, taken by others so 
that they can get inspiration from it and, and do something different. Um, and, then, and then again, provide that to generations ahead of them so that you know, inspiration can continue to thrive. And today we are so grateful for these inspirational words that you've had with all of us. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. I hope that the inspiration uh, keeps on thriving. I invite everybody who has not been in the galleries yet to come and pay us a visit. And, um, and thank you all for your presence here today. Thank you so much. We'll it's a, you it's a real pleasure to be able to talk about it and share with everyone. Wonderful. We'll see you very, very soon. Thank you, everybody. Bye.